Our opening speaker this morning is Evo Terra. And Evo, we first met 12 years ago when, uh, before podcasting was cool. But Evo was like the coolest podcaster around 12 years ago. <laughs> he is a former astronaut. That's what he's making me read this. He's a former astronaut, marine biologist. He now travels, writes, and spends too much time online thinking about the future. And uh, Evo, it doesn't say architect, because that would be the George Costanza introduction right there. Anyway, without further ado, please welcome our opening keynote speaker, Evo Terra. So, whoops, went too far. I'm a weirdo. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I'm a weirdo. One thing, guys, the notes aren't showing up on the small monitor, gentlemen, in the AV side. Notes. I have like one, I have an hour. And I would just stay on this slide for an hour and just tell jokes if that's what's required up here. It's a lot of fun. I could actually do that. But okay, I'm good. I'm good. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make this work. We're okay. Let me explain the level of weirdness I have. At the ripe age of 34, which wasn't very long ago, I left a super cushy, comfy, high-paying job in a very recession-proof business. And I left not because I was stressed, but because I stated that the biggest long-term threat our company faced wasn't our competition, it was from flying cars. And the CEO of the company had the gall to disagree with me. Bastard. Fast forward 12 years later, two vice president titles later, I left a cushy, high-paying job in a growing, large-scale advertising agency surrounded by people that I loved. This is from an eating contest between me and, and Kim. We were the fastest eaters in the company. It was great. Um, but I left this team, that's all them behind me, and I loved them to death. And I left not because I was burned out of advertising, which is easy to get, but because the clients we had kept paying us to do things that didn't have any measurable business outcome, and they just kept spending money on it, and I got sick of doing that. I really became more bored than anything else. So I quit, and I became a travel blogger. To be more precise, I started traveling and used the stories that I gathered during my travels and incorporated those into my, my blog and my podcasting and the social media, some of which I'd been doing for 15 years. It's just how it happened. And that's somehow I wound up here as your opening keynote speaker for TBEX Asia Pacific 2016, which is like the longest TBEX title I've had thus far. Um, thank you guys very much for attending. I hope you enjoy. <clears throat> where the, uh, the entire set of days takes you here. By show of rocket's approval, applause, or something else equally thrilling, how many of you are here to make money as travel podcasters? Really? Oh, travel bloggers. Thank you, Chris. Travel. Who wants to make money as a travel blogger? Tough crowd this morning. Um, Good, because you're going to learn a lot about that today. There are some really smart people leading some great sessions that will teach you the ins and the outs of what it takes to actually make this either a going business concern or at least in order to afford you the ability to travel around the world. You can do it. So, by that same level of applause, how many people are here because travel is your passion or travel leads you to your passions? Great. Lots of people you can learn from as well. Oh, by the way, this slide has nothing to do with passion. It's just that when you do a Google image search for passion, <laughs> trust me, that's the one you want to see, not the other ones. Turn safe search on next time, Evo. Got it. But there were some of you that didn't woot in either camp. And I, and I kind of get it because, honestly, I don't fit in either of those camps either. Even though I've definitely made money as a travel blogger, 
And even though I certainly have my own passions, it's not why I do what I do. To be honest with you, I think that having a singular focus on travel blogging as a business and or maintaining an unwavering dedication to your true passions, it can result in some missed opportunities today. Stifling innovation, actually, and leads to commoditization over creativity. Worst of all, being that focused on one thing can actually shut down dreams, which discourages people who like to dream about, well, dreams of the future. So I'm digging myself in a little bit of a hole here with many of the people in the room, so I need to pull back out for, for just a moment. Um, I promise you, I am not some crazy dope-smoking hippie, certainly not in this country, um, who just wants to sing Kumbaya around the fire. Thank you for getting that joke. I was afraid it wouldn't land. Um, I'm not that kind of person who wants to sing Kumbaya and lament how capitalism is destroying the world today. That's, that's not me. Um, nor am I here to belittle your life's great work, to tell you that your passions are stupid, you should quit, go out and get a job like the rest of us. No. No, I'm not saying that. First off, I don't have a job, so that would be a bad thing for me to say. I am here instead to give you permission to do something different. I'm here to encourage you to use this moment, TBEX Asia Pacific 2016, not to abandon your dreams, not to abandon your need to make money every single day, but instead to set aside those very real, very important concerns just for a while, from time to time, while you're at TBEX. And think about something much, much bigger. You can call it the future if you want. I like to call it tinkering with the way the world works. Now, in order to start this journey with you, I need to kind of unravel the script that we're all following. And by script, I mean the set of assumptions that do a pretty good job of predicting what we're going to do day to day in our lives. Now, that script is written by the people in the communities that we live in and amongst. It's part of the cities that those communities are a part of on a larger scale. It's influenced by the culture of our own country that we live in and where that country fits in the world at large. And in fact, our entire culture talks to us about this daily script. And I don't mean the East versus West culture, because culture is much more nuanced than that. That script that we all live by gets influenced by our travels, and sometimes completely changed by our travels, and certainly by the actions that we take when we're retelling the stories of those travels as we travel blog. Travel blogging tends to change your script. I'd like to change it a little bit more. But I have to warn you, there are evil forces at work that while they may not look like that, they really, really do not want that script changed. And because of that, and sometimes in spite of their own best intentions, they actively work against the future's best interest by keeping you on the straight and narrow path you're used to. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the advice that we get from our gurus and our mentors is oftentimes bad. Let me explain a couple good examples that illustrate that for me. You've probably heard the old adage, fake it till you make it. You've probably even said, fake it till you make it. It's everywhere. It's one of those things that when you say it out loud, it kind of feels good to come out of your mouth, right? And it sounds like it really, really ought to be true. It's not. It's not true for two reasons. One, there is no it to make. It's a continual journey. There is no it that's out there. More to the point, here's the secret. Everyone is faking it. Everyone fakes it. Everyone fakes it. That nagging little bit of doubt that stops you from doing something that you somehow overcame to register and show up at TBEX, awesome. Yeah, we call that the imposter syndrome. And everyone 
has it. Exceedingly successful business people, politicians, teachers, even surgeons, it's the normal state of how our mind operates. It's called the imposter syndrome. We're all faking it. We never, ever make it. That's the Dumbo octopus. He has nothing to do with faking it until you make it. He's simply there to remind me, Evo, stop ranting and move on to your next point. Got it. Thank you, Dumbo octopus. I will do that. Um, perhaps you've heard the old adage, failure to plan is planning to fail. Yeah, I hate that one, too. It, starts, it sets up a false dichotomy that is completely at odds with how we humans learn to do things. Things like walking, talking, there's no plan associated with those. We just learn those things. It's how we actually learn. And it also discounts all the countless happy accidents that are out there, like the discovery of penicillin. There was no plan in place. It just simply happened. I'll talk about that a little bit later. That's supposed to be the Dumbo octopus, but it's reminding me also to shut up and move forward, so I will, once again, moving on to the next slide. The script comes from the books that we read, that we shouldn't be reading, it comes from people who claim to have some ancient wisdom that is somehow relevant in every single aspect of our lives, or the misguided people who have found out that there's more money in easy answers that don't really work than actually doing their true cho chosen profession. Yes, it's the way our mind works and it's what we're taught all the time. This was my script. This is the script I grew up with. It said, stay in school, graduate high school, go to college, get a job, get a house, get a family, and you'll be successful. I would wager many people in this room followed or were told to follow, and maybe you didn't, that exact same script. Here's the problem with the script. It doesn't allow for a 19-year-old college dropout to create the social media site we can't live without today. Not part of the script. It fails on the other end of the script when terrorist attack in Bali lead marketers like this fine lady not to do anything in marketing but to completely overhaul how business transactions are processed throughout Indonesia. A happy accident, well an unhappy accident in her case, did that. And this certainly can't account for this guy who forgot to clean his desk one weekend, came back and made a discovery in medicine, penicillin, that saves millions, excuse me, Million, hundreds of millions of lives. Happy accidents that were not followed by the script. So now you're thinking, what the hell does any of this have to do with travel blogging, Evo? I get it, I get it, I get it. Or perhaps you're saying more specifically, what are you meant to take away from with all this ranting and raving when all you wanted to do was to secure a new sponsor for your blog? Okay, I get it, I will. Trust me, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. So there's another script you can follow that we should be following. And yes, it is of relevance to travel bloggers and just about anybody else that wants to do something different with the world. So bear with me a little longer. There's going to be a few weird statements that come up here as I blow your mind a little bit more, but I promise I'm getting to a good point at the end. Abundancy is starting to outpace scarcity in the world we live. Things that were once scarce are becoming abundant, and that creates an opportunity for everyone in this room. Let me explain. For those of us who were creating content on the web when it was very, very young, we had to be concerned with what we would upload, not because of parental guidance issues, but because of bandwidth. If we loaded big things up on the web, it would take you forever to pull them down. And the web was slow in the early days. But today, that bandwidth is no longer scarce. It's so abundant that we get ticked off when Netflix pauses three times during a movie. Bandwidth is no longer scarce. It is abundant. And it's abundant almost everywhere. I've been to four continents last year, and it was great everywhere except Australia. What's up, Australia? Why does your bandwidth suck? Staying in the line of technology for a moment, Processors like this, for those of us that can remember back when they were very expensive and at the time we thought very fast, but actually very, very slow. Well, thanks to things like Moore's Law, 
I lost my monitor completely, guys. My middle monitor went out completely. Thanks to things like Moore's Law, now processors are m working much better. They're faster. They're cheaper. Everything is wonderful. Everything is great process. In fact, they're so no longer scarce, they are now abundant, that we actively waste processors. All of us do. I'm looking around the room, and I see lots of devices that are out right now, right? We got Fitbits. We have tablets. We have laptop computers. By some estimations, most people in this room have 100 microprocessors on their person right now. A hundred. Where just 30 years ago, you were lucky to be able to afford to buy one to make your computer just a little bit faster. Processors went from scarcity to abundancy. It's not just technology. It's also the world around us. Take time for a moment. Like, take time to have a drink of water. It wasn't that long ago that I worked eight to ten hours every single day in an office job. I had a two-hour commute both directions. And that was actually pretty decent compared to some of the people that I worked with. And I'll bet many people in the audience can tell a similar story. Well, that doesn't happen as much anymore today because of things like telecommuting. Or things like us, those of us that now have non-traditional career paths to where we kind of make our own hours, or even freelancers that are out there. Time. Well, time's limited, right? There are 24 hours in a day. We can't actively make time, but we certainly can have more discretionary time or make better choices on what discretion we use about those times, which moves time from a scarce resource to an abundant resource. And lastly, money. Now, clearly, that's the hardest one to, to change, but we're, we're seeing it today. We're seeing it in a couple of different ways from technology, blockchain technologies, and cryptocurrencies, but that's not what I mean. I mean the choices we make about the money that we spend. We don't necessarily have to have more money. We have less things we have to spend money on, which gives us a greater surplus. So we get our own abundancy, not because we have piles and piles of cash, although I would love to have piles and piles of cash. We do it because of the choices that we make. Many of the people in this room make those choices every day on how we spend our money so it becomes abundant. Now, I need to take a step off of my privilege for a moment here and recognize that the pattern is not uniform. The world is not a fair place. And for billions of people, everything I just said is complete fantasy land. I get it. However, a world moving from scarcity to abundancy on many things is happening. No, it's not even, but I tr trust me, it actively is happening. If you thought that was weird, this one will probably give you an even bigger headache. Software is changing the world in which we live in, and we've all experienced it, travel bloggers, because we all know that to have an effective online presence, we no longer need to know HTML and CSS, that which the web is based on. We don't have to hire a web designer, and we certainly don't need to learn Python or some other programming language. We can literally have a website, click, and it's available right now because that knowledge has went from scarcity to abundance. And thanks to free tools like Canva and other tools, we can have a great looking website, we can have great looking business cards and other sorts of assets like in our media kit without having to learn how Photoshop and Illustrator work or having to hire a professional designer. Free tools do it for us today. We no longer have to know Final Cut Pro in and out, or have these big fancy cameras these guys are walking around the room with. Heck, we don't even have to think about taking video anymore. We just upload our experiences through social media channels and they're automatically created for us. It's an amazing tool. They're all over. Video, photography, everything. Um, the photography slide was up there and I missed that one. I need to talk about that for a second. You know, it used to be that you had to know how to, do, to develop film back in the day. Photographers remember this, you had to develop film. Now you don't even have to own a camera that's dedicated, right? It's just everywhere. We're automating our social media postings. Some of you right now are tweeting without tweeting. It's scheduled. Our email marketing campaigns are part of the automated process. It's the way that it works. We can monetize our blogs by adding a single line of code. That's it. 
We push two or three buttons and suddenly we've launched a brand new fulfilled by Amazon business so we can travel for a little bit longer. Now the assumption that the hard part, the human only part of actually writing and storytelling is somehow immune to these changes, it's wrong. It's not only wrong, it's fading fast. Does that scare you? Okay, that should scare you. That's, that's, that's kind of terrifying, I get it. And I think we can all agree that no good will come of this. Who thought pushing the robots around was a good idea? Have you not seen Terminator? Just, just a terrible idea. But software eating the world is a scary way to say something much more simple than that. And that is that as we move from scarcity to abundancy, the skills and knowledge that took a long time to acquire or were very expensive to acquire are becoming much more available to everyone in this room and beyond to do more things with. So let me put all of that together in a package and lead you to my, my conclusion of where this, where this goes, my current conclusion of where it goes, and also give you a little bit of hope. When we accept that abundancy is beating out scarcity, hidden there, it causes us to throw out that old script. That script no longer works for us anymore. And when the platitudes of that old script are figured out for what they actually are, then we rethink classic business model planning that got us in this mess in the first place. So when we toss out the business plan, the rigidity of that particular plan, we start accepting and even expecting happy accidents to happen that we can in turn exploit. Because when we understand those happy accidents change hard things to make them easier, they in themselves are causing abundancy to beat out scarcity because of just the skill pattern and everything cycles around all over again. Now, my Western cultural friends out there are saying, Evo, that sounds a lot like underpants gnoming. And if you don't know what underpants gnoming is, I don't have time to explain it to you. Ask a South Park friend. Um, but for those that do get it, the reason the underpants gnome problem was a problem is not because of the question mark in the middle. It's because it was a long-term plan with a clear definition of what was supposed to happen at the end. Now, did, he ju did I just say that long-term planning is bad? And having a well-defined vision is bad? Yes, I did just say that. And yes, anyone with an MBA is probably headed for the exits right now. But this is not an MBA level class. We're not talking about doing classic business style thing. We are talking about a new world that we have all lived inside of. If, if planning long-term visions are good and work for you, they work for you. But if they don't work for you, I have a solution. And that's it. It's called moving in the direction of maximal interestingness. To which you say, damn it, you just promised you weren't some crazy hippie and now you're making up these stupid sounding terms and all I wanted to do was find out how somebody will pay me to Snapchat. I get it. I get it. Or maybe you're not quite that angry, but you're sitting out there saying, no, I don't think that's the way things are working. And it sounds like what you're advocating is we just screw off and do things that seem interesting. It may have sounded like I said that, but I promise you, screwing off and just doing random things that seem interesting is not that. And maybe a real world example or two will help explain what the direction of maximal interestingness is, also called a DOMI, I may abbreviate it. Let me show you what that is with some real world examples. I've got to go back in time a little bit and talk technology because everybody will get this one. In the 80s, this is what the web looked like. It was all text. In fact, HTML, hypertext, markup language, was the way the web was built. It was based on this for, or text for one simple reason. Bandwidth was scarce. And with scarce bandwidth, you could only put certain things through. Text was the answer to that. But then a group of people, in the 80s had this crazy idea, this crazy assumption that that scarcity would become abundant and in the future everyone would have access to broadband. Now when that would happen, they had no idea. How that would happen, they had an idea and it wasn't balloons from outer space, which actually would work. Um, no, 
what they had instead is they had a rough idea of what would happen. Armed with the knowledge, and they firmly believed that everybody would get bandwidth at some point in time. Their rough idea was, within that environment, we would all consume all of our content. Television, radio, newspapers, the whole thing would come through the web browser, which was brand new at the time. That would overtake everything. When that would happen, they had no idea. How? They had another idea on that. What they said is, well, if we're going to get everything, I guess we should be, make a browser that can handle pictures first. And so they did. It's the first picture, the first browser back in the day. That was their first immediate step that they took along that path of maximal interestingness. And people loved it. So they did it again and again. And before long, we've got online streaming video. And we've got responsive web design. And we've got everything else that we can shove down a pipe because a group of people thought that maybe in a world with full broadband, we might need to first handle pictures and move on. By the way, they were right about broadband being everywhere, right? We have it now. But they were totally wrong about their rough idea that we would consume all or most of our content through a browser. We don't. Well, 18 to 34-year-olds are starting to right now, but the rest don't. But so what? It doesn't really matter. These guys couldn't have predicted smartphones. They couldn't have predicted Netflix. We are getting most of our content through the web. It's just not necessarily through the browser. But it doesn't matter. The browser was and still is highly important, and these guys made a lot of money launching those browsers to the world. It didn't matter that they got the rough idea wrong. Again, they knew eventually broadband would overtake everything, and they needed that first picture. They didn't have to predict with accuracy or certainty how things would change along the way. That's part of the uncertainty cloud. Would it actually happen that we'd be sitting in cafes watching Ronald Reagan, Max Headroom mix-ups together? No. That level of uncertainty, not knowing that and making small first steps, kills traditional business plans. But in the direction of maximal interestingness, it's the way things work. We didn't do cafes everywhere. They had no idea we'd be puking rainbows into our smartphones, which we're doing today. But it doesn't really matter because that's a logical step. That's part of the uncertainty towards something that's happening out in the future. This is okay. But note this. There isn't a goal. Puking into Snapchat does not lead to some ultimate goal these guys had. It was just, just simply a direction through some uncertainty of what the future is going to look like that we're living in today. I can't stress it enough. When you do things in the domey way, there is no goal. Moving in, the direct, moving in the direction of maximal interestingness, that's a long way to say there, has no single goal or even a group of goals associated with it. Let me give you another example that's real to me, and then I'll talk about travel as well. So in the early zero zeros, aughts, as we call them, um, I knew we were living in a world where audiobooks were very scarce. They were expensive to produce. They were expensive to distribute, and the audience was very small for audiobooks because you had to buy six CDs. It was, it was insane. But I knew that was going to change. In the future, we will have abundant levels of audiobooks. I just didn't exactly know how that was going to happen. But my rough idea had to do with this new thing called podcasting that had just come out, lowering the technology hurdle for people to create their own audio. So my rough idea of the future said independent authors who had been shut out of distributing audiobooks. Only big, big publishers could do it. Independent authors, many of which who were getting into podcasting already, would then flood the marketplace and become where we got most of our content from independent authors. That was my rough idea. So my first step that I did was let's make people do this. I reached out to the authors that I knew that were podcasting and said, can you make an audiobook? And that tested well. They started doing it. So then we put together a website where lots of them did it. And now we have a 730 titles of people that are, that are producing their content. It's been a 12-year-long business I've been running. But here's the thing. I was wrong about my rough idea. Totally wrong. This chart shows the indie published, the small little 7% thing. I said that was going to be the biggest one. I was wrong. Small to medium-sized publishers have really grown up. And even Amazon's come up and do it using those same 
assumptions I had about scarcity, that's why they're doing it more and more. But it doesn't matter that I was wrong about the rough idea, I was dead right on the vision. Audiobooks are now, and have been for the last several years, this is a perpetual headline they keep putting out, the fastest growing segmentation of the marketplace. I was right about things scarce becoming abundant, and I went in an idea, I went in the direction of maximal interestingness, and it's all working out fine for everyone. Okay, travel. I haven't forgot, this is a travel conference. I'm gonna talk about travel, but I wanna give you guys a big idea, because this works in big, crazy ideas that shows you nothing's really too far out in the future to do. This is going to be crazy. I'm just prepping you that. My radical idea, my, my rough idea of what the future might look like is this. Scarcity to abundancy via space travel. In the future, we will have access to space travel at or about the same cost structure as air travel is today. That's not the crazy part. That's, that's the part that's actually going to come true. It's only a matter of when. So my, that, that which is scarce is space travel. Sounds crazy, I know, until you hear me say my rough idea is that when you have an ability to travel, people will want to travel, and in the future, we will have space tourists. That's the crazy part. Thank you for not laughing directly at me. I appreciate that. That's nice. So that's my rough idea, but I don't have a next step. Well, I do have a next step, and i tell you what my next step is not. I'm not going to go try and compete with Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or any of the other dozen people that are out there actively creating cheaper rocketry. Uh, I'm not a rocket scientist. Even though I said astronaut, I was lying. Um, I'm also not a billionaire, so I can't do that. Um, I'm a guy who's pretty good with words. So my immediate next step is beat this guy. I'm a travel blogger. So why don't I just create a nice blog about space tourism, not the future of space, not all the cool things that are happening in space commercialization, but a truly dedicated focus on space tourism. This is the num this is, do you own this website? Are you here? Please say no, because I'm going to say bad things about it. Okay, good. Um, this is the number one result on space tourism blog. Number one. And it hasn't been updated 2012. I think I can do a better job than that. I think I can do a better job as a travel blogger. Now, you might be saying that I'm wrong. And you're right, maybe I am wrong about this thing. Well, I'm willing to concede I might be wrong on the timing. Right now, I think space tourism happens in decades, not years. I could be wrong. Maybe it's centuries. But think about this. If you're still wondering, it's never going to happen, Evo. Remember. All the things that were said about air travel when the Wright brothers started, or even when the first commercial jet started flying around really, really rich people. There are really, really rich people that are already doing space tourism. So maybe tomorrow, when the price comes down, it's only the very rich. And the day after that, kind of the so-so rich. There are 15 million millionaires on the planet right now. That's a pretty decent niche market, I would think. The great thing about this is the success of my Domi, Direction of Maxwell Interestingness, isn't based on a long-term plan of humans getting and settling Mars by 2030 or 2130 or anything crazy like that. There's no clearly defined vision out there because that doesn't exist in the direction of maximal interestingness. I don't have to create a well-formulated MBA-style business plan and try and get investors on this one. I'm just trying to start a blog by starting a single step to an audience that I think responds. And if they do, if that first step of me putting together a blog works, then I take the next step. I don't care about the uncertainty of the future. It's built into my plan. I keep my focus on immediate next steps. I can do this today because not only am I interested in the topic, but because I have an abundance of time. Not 100% free time, but I've got enough free time to dedicate some of it to seeing this Domi come true. I also have, albeit much, much smaller, an abundance of money so that I can spend not all every waking hour trying to just stay afloat. It's not, that's not the world I live in, so I, can, I have discretion on how to do that. And because I've got those two critical factors in my favor, those two scarcities becoming abundance for me and an interest, 
I can take the next step along that path of maximal interestingness. That unplanned uncertainty, that real unknown thing out there, business plans can and often do fail when presented with that. If the uncertainty gets too great, passions can and oftentimes do fade. We get interested in other things. Our passions wind up and change. But that uncertain thing in the middle is a hallmark of doing things in a domey style, which is designed to change. It's going to change. It's not a straight path like that. It's going to wave up and down. But every step predicates itself as I move towards the next interesting thing. Now, if you've got a working plan right now, stick with it. I'm not saying abandon your business plan. If you're doing what your passion tells you to do and you want to keep doing that, keep doing your passion. I'm not here to say throw out babies in bath waters. But I am here to say, if you came to TBEX to figure out what your next step might be, this domey path might be more interesting to you than filling out a full-on business plan. And I'd love to chat with you guys about it. Thank you much for your time and letting me uh, kind of blow your mind for a bit. My name is Evo Terra. Have a fantastic TBEX, everyone.